the students were retaining almost nothing from this boring, scripted program that probably cost tons of money. It just wasn't working. We needed to do something quite different. Hey there, I've got a question for you. When you were a kid, did your parents ever make you sit at the dinner table and eat all your vegetables and you couldn't get up till you were done? Yeah, me too. And I remember this one time when my neighbor was babysitting me and I think I was about five or six years old and she made Brussels sprouts for dinner and told me I had to eat them. Now, this was long before Brussels sprouts were a thing, like with balsamic and cranberries and walnuts and feta. Those Brussels sprouts, I can get behind those 100% because they're delicious. But these Brussels sprouts I'm talking about were straight up boiled. And now call me spoiled, but at that age, at the tender age of four and five, I'd never even seen a Brussels sprout. I was strictly a carrots, corn, and sometimes green beans kind of kid. So this was a big deal for me. Now, I bet you can guess how the story ends, right? (laughs) I refused to eat those stinky, gross Brussels sprouts, and she made me sit at that kitchen table and stare at them until my mom came and picked me up. Now, on the flip side, I loved Thanksgiving as a kid, and my maternal grandmother would make the usual dishes like everyone does, turkey, mashed potato stuffing, rolls, etc. But she also had some kid-friendly choices too, like homemade mac and cheese, and she would often make pigs in a blanket just for us kids. And there was always at least one kid-friendly, kid-friendly vegetable, if that's even a thing. And for dessert, There were three types of pies to choose from, apple, pumpkin, and pecan. And we could even have our pie a la mode if we wanted to. We got to eat whatever we wanted. Okay, enough about food because now I'm starting to get hungry. (laughs) But my point is this. When I was being forced to eat those gross, stinky Brussels sprouts, or rather stare them down for hours, I wasn't just angry. I was furious. I was positive that those nasty Brussels sprouts would kill me if they even touched my lips. But Thanksgiving at Grandma's, that was the best. Those are some of the best memories of my life, and those are the memories I'm going to hold on to and cherish forever. And that, my friends, is exactly how we want our classroom to feel, just like a Thanksgiving celebration, not a negative, you must do this because I said so type of experience. And in this episode, I'm sharing exactly how you can bring this type of feeling to your own classroom. Now, hold up. I know what you're thinking, right? I'm a mind reader. But Vanessa, not every day can be a party in the classroom. I've got standards to teach, curriculum to follow. We've got work to do here. And you've got a point. So let me ask you another question then. What if the work that your kids do in the classroom is the party? Think about that for a minute. What if learning is fun and memorable, like Thanksgiving, instead of unpleasant and something kids have to do because we say so, like Brussels sprouts, right? Why are we talking about this anyway? So here's an example. One year, we had a new reading interventionist on our campus. And about three weeks into the school year, she up and quit with no notice at all. She said the kids didn't want to learn. She wasn't seeing any progress. So she just gave up. And that's okay, because clearly she wasn't a professional educator, right? Because true professional educators, they know that failure is an opportunity to begin again. And we know that teaching is hard work, and we believe that we can do hard things. Okay, okay, I know. I'll put away my soapbox now. Back to the story. So, of course, the school hired a new interventionist, and as an instructional specialist, I was tasked with making sure this one didn't quit. So I got real familiar with that fancy reading program, the intervention program that our district had purchased, and right away, I realized there was a big honking problem. And the problem was, this program was so dry, I was convinced that it was designed to be a sleep aid and not an educational program. It had a script that the teacher was actually supposed to read from, 
directly off this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It said on the paper, pick up the paper and read this to your kids. Seriously, that's how boring it was. And after the script was read, oh, it gets even more exciting now. <laughs> the teacher shows a flashcard to the students and asks them to repeat the name of the letter a few times. Mm, good times, right? Then they were supposed to move on to that exciting workbook. They wrote the focus letter from the scripted lesson over and over and over again. It's not going to be any surprise to you that the assessment scores showed that the average number of letters a child in this group, in this program, knew was less than 10. And after one of these boring lessons, that number skyrocketed to 10. <laughs> it was the same flat line. There was, there was nothing happening after a lesson when we did the assessments. The students were retaining almost nothing from this boring scripted program that probably cost tons of money. It just wasn't working. There was nothing for the kids to touch. There was nothing for them to do. It was complete rubbish, wasted paper and wasted time, wasted time on the teacher and the student's part. No wonder this poor girl quit. I mean, if the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and inspecting different results, then clearly we needed to do something quite different. So you're probably wondering what we did. So we started teaching the way that we knew young children learn best instead of reading from a piece of paper. Now, I knew from experience that using music and movement was highly effective from using it in my own classroom for many years. So I introduced the interventionist to fun songs that included movements and hand motions to go along with each letter in the alphabet. And I also knew that kids had to, they must touch and manipulate objects to make the information that they're learning stick in their long-term memory. So the first thing I did was I got a set of magnetic letters and I had the interventionist use them in her lessons every single day. They started by sorting the letters in different ways, curvy versus straight lines, holes versus no holes. The kids were involved in touching and manipulating the letters, right? You get the picture. And then they started to focus in their lessons on the children's names, right? This helped make the learning meaningful to the children. It's not something I'm just saying at you. Here's an A, say A, write an A, right? There's no connection to that letter. Why am I learning this? I don't know. It's kind of like when they taught us calculus in high school. I'm like, am I ever going to use this? <laughs> right? Now we know that these skills that we're teaching are super important and they're foundational and they're critical to future reading success. But we have to make that connection for kids because at that young age, they don't know how important it is. And they were driving, like they did name puzzles and they were driving toy matchbox cars over big outlines of letters. And then something amazing started to happen. And you could probably guess what that is. They started learning their letters, right? Instead of dreading these intervention lessons, they started looking forward to them. That boring scripted program was still there. And the teacher she was following the general outline of the program, but when the scripts and the workbooks were set aside and she started teaching how research shows that young children's brains actually learn by using fun, playful, meaningful, hands-on interactions, the kids started to thrive and learn the material. And the assessment scores went up too. Another added benefit of all this, uh, making these changes, was that the new interventionist loved her job and the kids looked forward to going to class with her. Because you see, true early childhood professionals continually seek out ways to make learning fun and engaging for their students. They use assessments to fine tune their teaching methods and ensure that their students are learning. They're flexible. And when they encounter an obstacle, they look for another way to solve the problem. Early childhood professionals feel empowered to make instructional decisions because they use research-based best practices to guide them. 
And if you're looking for ways to make learning the alphabet more fun and engaging for your students, then you're going to want to check out my free alphabet essentials guide. Inside, you'll find plenty of hands-on literacy activities that your kids will fall in love with. Onward and upward. (laughs) 